Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've joined us. We are doing a series on the book of Galatians. This is lesson number four in the series, and many of our friends will be studying this lesson on October 22 of 2011. For those who are Seventh-day Adventists, this date should have special meaning. We'd like to begin by offering a word of prayer. Bow your heads with us, if you will. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we are here representing you the best we possibly can, speaking about you and about your character and your government. As Paul now seeks to lead us into the depths of the book of Galatians, may we follow him and understand what he has to say is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In this lesson, we'll be covering primarily Galatians 2, 15 to 21. For those of you who are familiar with the book of Galatians, Paul makes a brief attempt, very brief attempt, to sort of summarize the plan of salvation. Now, what have we got to lead up to this? Well, you remember in Galatians 2, 1 to 10, Paul talks about his own personal experiences, about where he came from, uh, the people he consulted and the people he didn't consult uh, to get his gospel. Then he goes and he mentions something very interesting. He mentions an experience at Antioch when he himself rebuked Peter to his face and in public. And we talked about that already. And so now we come up to verses 15 through 21. Some scholars believe that this is a summary of what Paul had to say to the church there at Antioch when he was rebuking Peter. Others say this is Paul's conclusion that he was writing in the book of Galatians sometime later. So you can take your choice. Well, what was the issue? Peter had been exercising his freedom in Christ, setting aside his prejudices as a, as a Jew and eating with Gentiles. But when some conservative Jewish Christians arrived from Jerusalem, Peter stopped eating with the Gentiles and returned to behavior according to his Jewish prejudices. This led to several of the other Jewish Christians in Antioch to following his example, including Barnabas. And that was too much for Paul. Paul recognized that a crisis was developing and that it must be met head on, so he rebuked Peter in public. Um, in this brief summary, Paul discussed some key concepts in his writings. Things like justification, righteousness, works of the law, belief, faith, and the faithfulness of Jesus. In this lesson, we will attempt to dig into the meaning of some of these expressions. Where would you start if you were Paul trying to address a group of Jewish Christians in the context of a Gentile church? Have you ever thought about that? Well, Paul started with the, view, the Jewish viewpoint, traditional Jewish thinking, we might say. Uh, he was dealing with those who called themselves Jews by birth and also with those who were, quote, Gentile sinners. It was his hope to grab the attention of the Jewish Christians and carry them with him through his argument. The Jews considered themselves to be the elect of God, that is, God's chosen people. And of course, they had many, many verses in the Old Testament that to support that idea. They had been entrusted with his law. You can read about that in Romans 3, 1 to 3. God had offered them a covenant relationship with him, Exodus 19 through 24. You remember the Mount Sinai experience. By contrast, Gentiles were considered by Jews to be sinners. Most Gentiles did not even know about God's law. And even if they did, they did not believe it applied to them. You can read about that in Ephesians 2, 12 and Romans 2, 14. So in Galatians 2.16, as he starts through his argument, Paul went to the next step and clearly stated that the spiritual privileges that had been offered to the Jews did not make them any more acceptable to God because no one could be put right with God by doing what the law requires. What, what were these spiritual privileges? <clears throat> well, it's difficult for me to difficult for me to understand that I don't know. Some people would have 
certain kinds of blessings from God and others wouldn't have option, though, you know, those options. But Well, look at the Old Testament. <clears throat> Do we have any other nations in the world that produced a document like the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. No. God communicated with Abraham. God communicated with the people of Israel down through the generations. And they looked at that and they say, Do you have any books like that? No. Do you have any books like that? No. We're, we're special. You know, what's it's hard for people who have something to think that they're no better than someone else. Mm -hmm. Like the Jews had, they were the chosen people. How could they even realize or have a concept that they were no better than people who were not the chosen people? Yeah. And sometimes rich people, how, how they think they're better than poor people when really we're all the same in God's eyes. So it's very hard for people with something to believe that so I, I don't see how uh, this argument, um, I mean, it was difficult to make. Mm -hmm. I can see them saying, oh, no, you're not right. We are the chosen people. Yeah. At, at, at the same time, sometimes when you have things that others don't, you don't realize how much you have and how little they don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, though, um, when these Judaizers, Judaizers came in, what were they trying to do? Um, if, if you say that this was just a, a bias between their, their um, people versus these other people, what, what were they trying to do to, make to, to deal with okay. that bias? They believed firmly in their minds that God had a special chosen people. And the way those people were set aside from all the other people in the world is that they were circumcised and they observed all the requirements of the law. They were Jews fully and completely. Not, not because of um, blood? Well, they accepted the fact that people could become Jews even though they had no Jewish blood in their system if they followed all these. They had, among, in the Jewish synagogues, scattered around the diaspora, scattered around the Mediterranean, because there were many Jews that had moved to other areas to, for, the adva for business advantages, basically. And there were two groups of people. That, and and the, the rules were if there were 10 Jewish families in a city or a town, they were supposed to establish a synagogue. Well, a certain number of other people were attracted to these synagogues. Said, well, you know, what's different about you? They got tired of the pantheistic religions of the Greeks and the Romans and fertility cult religions and the mystery religion. They said, this Jewish religion, it's, we like it. So there were two groups that joined the synagogue. The Jewish synagogue. Now we're not, not talking about Christianity. We're talking about Judaism here. The two groups who joined. By far the largest group were called God-fearers. People who respected and reverenced God. And those people were people who attended the synagogue, more or less believed all the Jewish beliefs and so forth, but didn't go all the way and get circumcised and do all those details to that but extent. But they could have. But they could have. They had the option. Have. The people who went all the way, did the circumcision and everything, were, recall, were called Jews. Okay, so this big argument that Paul is making is that you don't have to do that anymore. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and, and then the, he the does Judaizers. a lot of explaining here of what's really important, mm -hmm. not what they were saying that was important. Well, what they were saying is, remember now, we're talking about the Christian Jews, not regular Jews, okay? So they're saying, you have become a Christian. Now, if you want to be a super Christian, you also follow, follow the Jewish requirements. Then you'll be a number one. You can, go into the, you can go into the first class section if you do these other things. A super Christian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul. Really? So, so there was a, a less, lesser Christian but, in their but eyes. you're still saved. Well, that, that's debatable. Okay, so you either had to do it or you wouldn't be saved. Is kind of some basically of them, how it was some going Some of them, in. I'm sure, believed that. Did Paul say you didn't have to be a God-fearer and you didn't have to be a Jew? So he was including both categories. Paul said you can become a Gentile Christian without doing any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're fully a Christian. Now, there are two very important ideas that Paul jumps into fairly quickly. 
They're found in Galatians 2, 16 and 17. And I'm going to read from my Good News Bible. Uh, in fact, I'm going to start with verse 15. Indeed, we are Jews by birth. Now, these are the two categories we've already talked about. Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, as they are called. Yet we know that a person is put right with God. Now, we're going to discover that uh, many of our more conservative Christian groups will translate that be justified by God, justified, put right with God, only through faith in Jesus Christ, never by doing what the law requires. We too have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be put right with God, there it is the second time, the same word, through our faith in Christ and not by doing what the law requires. For no one is put right with God by doing what the law requires. If then, as we try to be put right with God by our union with Christ, we are founded, found to be sinners as much as the Gentiles are, does this mean that Christ is serving the cause of sin? By no means. So four times, that's the first thing we want to notice, four times in these two verses, he uses this, this word, put right or justified, whatever. The Greek word is dikaiao, and you can see it here highlighted. If I, and I'll have to get off of this here, so if I can. Um, the word is right there, dikaiao, D-I-K-A-I-O-O, if we were to try to write it in modern English letters. It's often translated justified and found, is found four times in these two verses. The Greek word dikaiao was sometimes used as, a, as legal language. It can mean to declare something right. However, the basic meaning, you see the OO at the end of the word. Words that end up with OO talk, have a different sort of a slant, a different sort of a connotation in Greek. Uh, if a judge is doing his jo job properly, when he declares something right, they truly are right. I mean, isn't that what we ask the judges to do? We ask them to make valid, correct judgments, right? This word can also be translated as put right or set right. We saw that in my Good News translation. The most literal translation into English would be rightify, if we had such a word in English. A similar Greek word is petrao, you notice once again the OO ending, which is translated petrified. When we say something is petrified, does it mean that it has been declared stone or that it has really become stone? So you can see the idea here. Um, You're put right. Mm -hmm just like a stone and it can't be undone? Yes. If a, well, I mean, if, if a log, if a tree is petrified, it becomes stone. It doesn't go back. No. Uh -uh. Okay. You know, it doesn't put right and justified. They do have meanings that, that intersect that are the same, mm -hmm. but they have some innuendo that's mm -hmm. a little different that pulls people's minds off the wrong here's, way. Here's that. I have a particular bias. I'm, I'm just going to say that right up front. I would rather not use the word justify, and the reason I would rather not is because there's a million different ideas about what that word means. It has a so lot of baggage. It has a lot of baggage. If I say justify, probably every one of you around this table, and we're, we're less diverse than, than many Christian groups, will have a different idea of what I'm meaning when I say justify. So, but if I say put right or set right, you all have got more or less the same idea of what that means. Okay? That's a Latin term, isn't it? Just yeah. Justify. Well, I'm going to talk about that right now. So how did we get from the Greek word dikaiao to the English word justify? Well, when translated into Latin, the Greek word dikaiao, dikaiao becomes eustidia. Since during much of Christian history, the language of Christianity was Latin, when English translators were producing an English New Testament, they took the Latin, justidia, and made it justify. Unfortunately, in modern legal parlance, justice has come to have a very different meaning. So we need to make an effort to go back and determine what the original biblical concept meant. So the issue is whether or not justify means simply to be declared right, or does it mean to be put right or set right? Or does it make any difference? Can you explain the difference between declared right and put right? Does declared right mean that you're declared right without any change in you? And to put right means that you become... Actually change. You're actually, you actually change. change. Yes. Mm -hmm. Basically. So what we're talking about here is how does God 
deal with sinners? Does he just say, I know you're a sinner. We're not going to change anything. I don't expect anything new from you, but I'm going to declare you righteous. Or does he say, when I declare you something, or when I put you something, you're actually changed? He demonstrated, mm -hmm. the ultimate demonstration was at the cross, that uh, he, God is righteous, and if you admire God and you want to become like him, then you have the potential of being reckoned as righteous. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, basically what happens is that you, you kind of try to find favor with God legally when mm -hmm. you use the word justify, mm -hmm. which, which it kind of goes off point right there. Yeah. You know, it could be argued that um, to be declared right and to be put right are, are in essence the same thing. That is, uh, if you're declared, then it is spoken, mm -hmm. so to speak. And when God spoke in creation, it came to be. Mm -hmm. So, if he declares that you are right, uh, that you're just, or... The, the problem or, is that there are many people who, who, when using the word justify, focus primarily on forgiveness. And they want it to be very clear that there doesn't need to any change happen in us at all for God to declare us right. It's deceptive, isn't it, not, when, when you take that approach? Well, would you, would you restate that? Yeah. There are many people who take this word justify to, to be primarily talking about forgiveness. And they would say, God forgives you. Your record is clean because God doesn't see anything wrong with you now. You've been forgiven. And you don't ha it doesn't have to change you in any way. It doesn't need to, you don't need to, your behavior doesn't need to change. Nothing needs to change. All that matters is God views you in a different light now. Well, you know, the stories in the Old Testament are full of people who evolved to become more God in character. Like Rahab, mm -hmm. she didn't stay a prostitute. She became better. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul made it very clear that we can never be declared righteous or set right or put right by observing the law. Now, what does that mean? We could be put right with God if we could keep the law. There's a couple, of, I mean, there are many verses, but let me just show you a couple. Leviticus 18.5, follow the practices and the laws that I give you. You will, be, you will save your life by doing so. I am the Lord. What does that say? In Ezekiel 18, it says a similar thing. Yeah. You stop doing such bad things, you'll, you'll save yourself. Yeah. Uh, Romans 2.13, over in the New Testament, for it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law commands. How are we put right with God? Looks like by doing what the law commands, right? It's what it says right there. Now, the people who don't like that idea um, want to say, no, it doesn't happen that way. And, 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 and they're correct. The bottom line is we can't do it alone by ourselves the only way our lives will be changed is by beholding what of course there could, it could be open to interpretation about what what the law commands yes sure yeah this is certainly not by works of the law so what do we mean by beholding we'll to get to that in a little bit more a little bit later it is not by any legal maneuvering either remember that the word sometimes translated justify literally means to be made righteous the word right or righteous in, in, in Greek is dikos for right, or righteousness is dikaiosune. Nobody argues about that. Dikaiosune means righteousness. But then when they go to dikaiao, oh, it's, it's to be justified. It should be to be made righteous, to, to fit, to fit with the meaning of the word. Well, you know, when God puts something right, when you put something right, you actually take it and you put it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so God reaches down and takes us and puts us right? Well, puts us right in relationship to what? That's the question. When God declares a sinner justified or put right or set right, using these three expressions, is that legal fiction? Does it mean 
we are declared right, but we're not really right. Does God's Christ's robe, some people would put it this way, Christ puts his robe of righteousness over us, and we may be just as scoundrel, much scoundrels inside as we ever were before, but now we have Christ's robe of righteousness on us. So God looks at us and he says, he can't see the sinners that we are inside. God doesn't have 20-20 vision. He sees the robe of righteousness. He says, that's fine. Let him in. Well, it depends on what we think is happening to us. Mm -hmm. uh, what is happening to us that we get declared righteous? Yeah. Well, do peop are people really set right in some real sense when God justifies them? Well, it depends not sure. what's happening. Well, that's, that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> what is? That's the question. What is happening? Well, one thing's for sure. Uh -huh. You are valuing God more than you did before. Hopefully. Yeah, oh, yeah well, you've got to be. Because, Better be. Um, I mean, if you didn't value him any more than before, then what would be the point? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what, do, what do you set right in relation to? Are you now right in relation to the way the sun comes up? Are you in right in the way the waves roll in? Are you right in the way that, um, you know, what does it mean <laughs> to be made? What yeah. are you right in relationship to what? Well, what are you, I'm now right in relationship to, to what am I? Relationship to God somehow? The, uh, yeah, the idea is that you're now right in relationship to God's requirements for entering heaven, for salvation. Which is, what did you just say? <laughs> I just said, whatever, and, and that's an argument, but I'm, I'm trying to sidestep that part of the argument. Okay. I'm saying, you have now met the requirements to be saved. These people are adamant that justification is the only requirement for salvation. You know, that's very frustrating because you go to church week after week after week, mm -hmm. and then you go home the other six days and your life is a mess. Mm -hmm. I mean, church mm -hmm. is supposed to help you put the pieces together and to somewhat move forward so that you have a together life. And if God isn't willing to put, help put the pieces together and write your life, stop your alcoholism and, and just, you know, mm -hmm. put your then of what worth is it? Then you might as well walk away from the church. I mean, because you just have an exercise in feeling yeah. good for one day. But, it, but is that happening because you didn't make the decision or you're happening, is it happening because it has too much power over you? Do I, do I know any people like you've described? Well, you, are, there, are there people on the street? Is there a group of people oh, that, yes. uh, you know, is my local oh, yes. senator, are they that way or? Yes. or you absolutely know people who firmly believe what we've been talking about. Oh, yeah. If God could just <coughs> declare that I'm right, make everyone here right, righteous. What about the whole world? Yeah, why not everyone? Mm -hmm. And why not Lucifer in the beginning? Yes. Why do we have this conflict? Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that what they want to do at the Vietnam War? Just pr pronounce that they won and leave? Well, if he... It's if, just yeah. like that, if you think of it. If he... If he, if he puts things right, and where is free will? What, what what is what are the qualifications for being put right? Yeah. Oh, sure. Are there qualifications? Well, and if there's no, qualifications, no. then no, you know yeah. I, could, I ought to be able to do that, and he wouldn't have to put me right. Well, the qualification, of course, they would say is faith. What? Faith. faith. Well, this faith. was Paul, but uh, some of the previous passages you read, faith in Christ, and I was going to ask, what does that mean? What is faith in Christ? Well, well, I'm, yeah, I'm what, what happens when you don't have faith, when you have faith? You, have, you yeah. didn't have faith before, now you have faith. So why, what, what is in the chemistry here that's changing everything? Faith, faith in Christ to do what? Well, n let me. I'm going to faith make, that he I'm is the Christ, or faith that he can... I know, you have faith in Christ, so you start looking at him. And then you start changing because by, by beholding you, you start changing. If you don't have faith in Christ, you don't even look at him. Yeah. Well, faith in what he says, too. Yeah. So, then, so then you have faith in Christ and you develop a relationship in him and then you get changed. So now you're qualified because you're changed. Well, see, but they don't like that because that sounds like works. Well, that's kind of the direction I was going. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, but here's, here's <laughs> isn't that works? Some, some work <laughs> has to be done. It's just the question is who does it? 
Well, mm -hmm. but hold on. Uh, there's another <laughs> very, very important part of this argument that you never gets raised because it, it throws a real different slant on the whole thing. Way, way, way back, hundreds of years ago, Peter Abelard, who lived from 1079 to 1142, wrote a book entitled Cur Deus Homo, which means, why did God become man? And he raised a question which evangelical Christians have still not resolved. He wrote, for what justice, now remember justice is the Latin word, this is written in Latin originally, justice here means righteousness. For is it right, what justice is there in giving up the most just or righteous man of all, who would that be? That would be Jesus. That would be Jesus. What justice is there in giving up the most righteous man of all to, to death on behalf of the sinner? What man would not be judged? Now, who's the judge up there that's doing this and making these decisions? Well, we usually picture God. God, okay. What man, God we're talking about here, he's using man as an illustration, would not be judged worthy of condemnation if he condemned the innocent in order to free the guilty? For if he could not save sinners except by condemning the righteous, the just, where is his omnipotence? Don't we think God can do anything? Isn't that what omnipotence means? He can't force. He can't force you to love. He can't or he won't? He, he, well, if, he's he if God is love, not to. Yeah, if, if God is love, he has a choice, yeah. so he can make a choice, and his choice is to do everything in harmony with the, his character, which is love. <laughs> okay, so, but, but if, if we're using this strict I understand. thing, I, the, the logic. point here is if God has the ability to fix everything, like Gordon says, why didn't he start out with Lucifer back in the beginning? Well, we're asking is that what does that say about God? That's yeah. what we're saying. Yeah. We're trying well, to, you know, that's very confusing when you're sitting in a church because you're seeing this innocent man had to die and somehow that made you, your sins exactly. go away. And it, it just doesn't make sense. Well, and that's the other side of the argument. If God could do this, but he's not willing to for some reason, if he could but would not, how are we to defend his wisdom and justice? You see, can God do this or can't he? Well, is he that moody that, <laughs> well, <laughs> that he could <laughs> if change he's moody, his mind if it's because moody, somebody you did want, something right? Do you, you want to live with him for the rest of eternity? When you say, can God do that, what do you mean by that? Can he pardon sinners by condemning an innocent man? Is that what well, here, you mean here's by the, that? Yeah, here's the situation. We're a bunch of sinners, okay? The Bible says very clearly we're a bunch of sinners, okay? So God has to deal with us some, well, of course he could ignore us and just let us die, but he chooses to do something. Now, what we say is, well, Jesus came along, we're sinners, Jesus came along, he died for us, and now we're going set free. Try to imagine a judge. He's got a whole courtroom full of terrible criminals. They're murderers, they're, you know, rapists, they're all the worst kind of sinners you can imagine. The whole courtroom full of them. And he's about to condemn all of them to death. He's just about to bang his gavel down and say, that's it, you all die. And in right, in runs a man who is known by to everyone to be perfectly righteous, he's never committed a sin, he's never committed a crime, he's never done anything wrong his entire life. And the man says, wait, 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 I, I will die on behalf of all these people. And the judge says, well, all I needed was for somebody to die, that's good. Okay, bang, you die and all these people can go free. And does that change those people? Does it change those people or do, is, is that justice? Mm -mm. Well, plus a judge was there trying to figure out who the bad guys are to get them off the street. Somebody comes in and puts them all back in the street again. Where, where have you gotten? Yeah, you know? exactly. So, so what are we saying about God if we, if we suggest that he can only save sinners by condemning Jesus? Does it make any sense to condemn the only righteous person who's ever lived, make him die, so you can save a bunch of scoundrels? No. no. You know, this whole concept, it keeps reminding me of somebody paying off an evil banker mm -hmm. to, you know, for some widow somewhere. They come in there, the, the banker's going to get this widow and do something terrible to her, and then somebody nice comes and pays off the, the banker, and he says, ah, oh, I can't do anything now. And then he walks off. So uh, there's that kind of paying the price, or 
there might be a price where a person comes in, like a teacher, to teach somebody, you know, all the things he's got to go through, you know, the, to teach somebody to do the right thing. So, of course, these scoundrels in the courtroom, if they were so impressed by what this man would do for them, mm -hmm. that they thought, you know, I think I, I think I've got a, I've got a second chance now. I think I'd like to become like that man. Mm -hmm. I don't think that. Oh don't. yeah, that's that's the big argument. That's the big thing that's supposed to happen, isn't it? That all those people that were supposed to be condemned well, to die, right. they're going to have a change of heart now because this person was so graceful to come in here and, and actually but the get them off the hook. The people who want to take the legal approach will, will turn purple and green and all kinds of colors if you suggest that to them because they will say that's the moral influence theory. So God comes along. Well, I he, hear that all the time. He gives you a good example and you say, that's nice. I think I'd like to become like that. But what's wrong with this with this idea of these uh, these uh, this idea that somebody comes in and and he dies and all these wicked people get turned loose? What what's wrong with that idea? What well, what what's the what in the okay, end? What is that going to lead us to do? Let's go back up here and look at our argument here. What the 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 biggest thing that's wrong with it is what it says about God. And that is. For if he could not save sinners except by condemning the righteous, where is his omnipotence? But if he could but would not, how would he defend his wisdom and justice? That was, that was Abelard's argument. He'd be like an evil banker. Yeah. So. Is that the kind of person you want to live with for the rest of eternity? Or he was bloodthirsty and we're looking forward to getting all those sinners off the streets, but now he's satisfied with the blood of his son mm -hmm. and let the, let the sinners still, be, oh, they changed? Not likely. Mm -hmm. Not likely that they are a really very small moody. percentage. He is really moody, and the son comes over and really impresses him and says, you know, you know, son, you're right about that. Let's just let him go. I've changed and, my and mind. What happens the next time he gets moody? That's it. I think um, many people have thought of this, but they have not wanted to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, the logical consequence of, of this pattern of thought is what is important here? in this salvation is just somebody's got to die. That's well, see, and that's, that's the question. That's some God, people all, say all God, God wants says, is just, you know, some, we, we got to, somebody's got to die here. Right. We're right or bad or whatever it is. It's, somebody some, call, they call that somebody the, has to die. They, they call that the law, <laughs> but really that is not what the law is really about. The law is the way the universe runs and writing it down is declaring how it, it tried to demonstrate how the because uh, God was accused of being arbitrary vengeful and forgiving exacted severe tyrannical and so forth and he has to demonstrate that he's not that way and it takes a long time especially when he's got a lot of speakers yeah. saying that he is that way we've got, we've got a lot more things to talk about so let's move along and see how some of the ideas we've talked about might apply a second major question is, apart from this one about what is righteousness, it is set right, put right, justify. A second one is, what did Paul mean when he said law? Some would like to limit law to the Ten Commandments. This is clearly not what, God, what Paul intended. Some would like to include all the requirements spelled out by Moses under the moral law and the ceremonial law. So they would say it's these two laws put together. This is probably also not adequate. We need to remember that to his Jewish audience, the law meant Torah which is the usual name for the five books of Moses. <coughs> so although the phrase, now there's a passage here taken from or, or, or describing something that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Although the phrase works of the law does not occur in the Old Testament and is not found in the New Testament outside of Paul, stunning confirmation of its meaning emerged in the 1947 with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a collection of writings copied by a group of Jews called Essenes. Now these Essenes, remember, are super conservative, um, who lived at the time of Jesus. Although written in Hebrew, one of the scrolls contains this exact phrase. The scroll's title is Mixat Mas HaTorah, which can be translated important works of the law. The scroll describes a number of issues based on biblical law and concerned with preventing holy things from becoming, from being made impure, including several that mark the Jews out as separate from Gentiles. At the end, the author writes that if these works of the law are followed, you will be reckoned righteous. 
Now that's Leviticus 18.5, Romans 2.13. We just read it up, up there. Um, what does reckon mean? Does it mean thought of? Account of. We're going to talk about that again in a moment. Um, unlike Paul, the author does not offer his reader righteousness on the basis of faith, but on the basis of behavior. And that's quoted in our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday. A third essential component in understanding this section in Galatians is an understanding of the word faith. What is faith? First of all, we need to recognize that the Greek word pistis, which is the word we translate faith into faith, has been translated variously as faith, belief, trust, and even confidence. So any four of those words could be taken back to the same Greek word and they could, so when you read belief, you can put in faith. When you read trust, you can put in faith. When you, when you read confidence, you can put in belief or trust. Paul told the jailer in Philippi that the only re thing required for salvation was faith, Acts 16, 31. But what is this elusive thing called faith? And I love a dis description here that, that was originally penned by a very good friend of mine, Dr. Graham Maxwell. And he put it like this. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with the person well known. The better we know him, the better this relationship may be. We can't say will be because we know the story of Lucifer who knew God very well and chose to rebel against him. This faith implies an attitude toward God of love and trust and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based upon the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what God says when we are sure that he has said it, to accept what God offers when we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do what God wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith is perfectly safe to say, this is why faith is the only requirement for salvation. You remember our verse, Acts 16:31. Nothing more complete could be asked of a person. Faith also means that, like Abraham and Moses, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. So faith is? A relationship with God as a person that we know very well, a friend. So we are sa saved by that relationship. We're saved by that relationship. That's correct. It's no. almost written like, that was almost written like, it, it, faith is a character also. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure my relationship with God is, is as good as Gary's here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you how, know, how, how, how good does my faith have to be? Well, you remember that Jesus said if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed and it's so small you can hardly see it, oh, well, you I could got, move I, mountains. I got it made. Are we graded on the curve? Well, <laughs> that would be the next question. Well, you know, some people um, have problems trusting because of their history and they mm -hmm. haven't been able to trust anybody. A little bit of trust in God for them, is, to God, is a lot uh, versus mm -hmm. someone who knows how to trust um, easily because of they've been trained by trustful people. Now, here's one of the other questions. The people who are so concerned about forgiveness and justification are focused on our past sins. They say, if I can just get rid of those past sins somehow, or if I can just keep God from seeing those past sins, then my record will look pure and God will save me. I would like to suggest that when God saves people into the kingdom of heaven, he's not nearly so concerned about our past sins as he is about what we're going to do in the future. Now, I can't see the future, but he can. So his concern is not what happened to me in the past, but what I'm going to do when I move in, right? So that means I may not have no control over my, my destiny because I can't see what's going to happen in the future, but he can. Well, but you have, a way of, you have a way of determining that. Are you moving closer and closer to God? Can God see in you progression in the right direction? Let's let read on. Being justified or put right or set right in God's eyes is more than just a way of dealing with our past sins. What would be the purpose of setting someone right or putting him right if he just continued doing the evil things he had been doing? It is by beholding that we become changed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 is an excellent example of that. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord by, with uncovered faces 
And that same glory, coming from God, from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into His likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. And that's how the change takes place. How, how much focus do I need to put on, on uh, uh, becoming more like Him? I mean, does, well, does it have to be a 48-hour-a-day job, or can I just kind of do that casually, or what, that's, what, what, uh, how yeah. much is that? Uh, that's a good question. When, when children are born into a family, they become like their parents. Why is that? <coughs> they are focused on those parents 24-7, aren't they? They want to know what the parents do. They're going to, you, you can, when children are about a year and a half or two years old, you can see them watching their parents and they will try to do it just the way mom or dad does it. That's a scary thing when you see it in, in the kids. <laughs> yeah, when, when you see, You're not supposed to say that. When you see part of yourself in your own children, yeah. parts that you just as soon didn't exist, habits well, and attitudes the, and patterns. And so the point is, if you read Great Controversy, page 555, which we're not going to take time to read right now, it says there, it is a law of the mind that by beholding we become changed. You know, it is so true because you can raise your kids and if they are beholding trash, um, Satan knows this. He, he gets the TV going with his um, lessons he wants to teach kids and then you plop your kids in front of the TV or even in school you let them run with the wrong group. Um, but there's also the argument that Satan had the perfect example. Yes. The perfect environment. That does, but in other words, the perfect environment doesn't guarantee that you go in the right direction. But a terrible environment almost guarantees that you won't. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that um, Satan never did have faith? Well, he lost it somewhere along the way at least. Now, if you can lose it, mm -hmm. how, could you, how could faith save you? And what was he beholding? Well, well still, my Himself. point is, you know, um, you're saying that when you have faith that God can look through the future and he can tell what you're, you're going to do, what sins or you will or will not do in the future. Mm -hmm. Now the same thing happened when Satan was created. Yes. And, um, and so he must have never had faith even though he was created. Even during the time he didn't have, he was... No, no, it doesn't mean he, he never had faith. It means God knew that someday he was not going to have faith. So he lost his faith. Yes. So then how does faith guarantee that you'll be saved forever? If you keep well, it. Well, yeah, keep how, it. how, suppose I get into the pearly gates because I've got all the faith I need. How do I, how does, uh, what, what, what happens if I, why won't I do what the same thing as it? Satan? What if you lose it? Well, let, let's back up a little bit. The key question first is how do we get it? And the Bible tells us that. It's found in Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. The way we become like God is studying His example. And the way we have to study His example, of course, from a human point of view, is studying the life of Christ. You know, in the book of Desire of Ages, it says it would be well to spend a thoughtful hour every day in contemplation of the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. But still there's no guard whether or not you'll, you'll keep it well, forever but here's Well, here's, but here's the clue. Romans 14, 23 says that, faith, in effect, it says, faith is what brings us closer and closer to God, and sin is what takes us away from God. So faith is the opposite of sin, okay? Faith is the opposite of sin in that verse. Now, if we come to see the truth about God, and if we recognize its truthfulness, and the reason why it is the only way to run a government, then we should eventually get to the place where we would say, that's the right thing to do. I choose to do that because it is the right thing to do. And we have suggested in a previous lesson that freedom means that. You can do whatever you want. And there will be perfect freedom in heaven because 
no one will even want to do what's wrong. That's, that's the point of it. Okay. Now, let's, let's follow the argument of some of these people, that, some of the opponents here. You know the verse in Genesis 2.17, it says, except the tree, you may eat of all these fruit, the tree of all the fruits in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad, you must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Okay? So we're saying basically sin leads to death. Uh, that argument was answered by the life and especially by the death of Jesus. The life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. We can choose to become more like him on a day-by-day -day basis and thus live lives as close as possible to his life, or we will die as he died, what is sometimes called the second death, which is the result of sin. Now, Jesus gives that example because all sin was placed on him, and mm -hmm. then that caused him to die. Well, w w let's talk about that for a moment. What, what does sin do to us? It separates us from God. Where do you find that? In the Bible. 59, In the Bible. Isaiah 59, verse 2. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. Isaiah 59, 2. So there it is, right in the Bible. Don't be embarrassed. You're, you had the right answer. Well, Paul's Judaizing opponents were trying to convince the Galatians that they would not be saved by faith alone, but rather by faith plus a certain amount of works. Paul was obviously adamantly opposed to that approach. As a former Pharisee of the Pharisees, he should have known, right? So faith is not just a legal claim by which we are granted the legal status of Jesus our Savior. Faith is a relationship with God as with a person well known. And what happens? By beholding the life of Jesus and loving what we see, we become changed bit by bit, step by step, into his image. In other words, Faith has its, as its primary goal, not the eradication of our previous sinful records, which is impossible anyway, but the living of a new life in relationship to Jesus Christ. And a relationship would be defined as reading God's diary or his Bible to getting to know him a little each day, praying a little each day, thinking about what God has done and thinking about him every day. So. It's like those steps you take to build a relationship. Sometimes yep. people say a relationship with God, and you're thinking, how can I do a relationship with God? He's not here, you know. I, I teach a class of young people, mm -hmm. and I've had a lot of experiences. People sort of come and go over the years, because this is a university setting. And um, every once in a while, I, I notice a young lady or a young man will come into class, and pretty soon I find them sitting beside each other, and I notice that there's a relationship developing. Now, how does that happen? They start talking to one another. Yes, and? Spending time together. Spending time together, yes, and? Getting to, getting know, to each. know each other, right. And what they actually do is the young man is doing everything possible to picture himself in the best possible light to sell himself to the young lady, and she is doing the same thing to him. They're talking about each other, okay? I mean, they're talking about themselves, and she, he's talking about him, she's talking about her, and they're getting to know each other, okay? Well, That's some, how people get to know each other. There's some hormones in there, too. <laughs> well, the hormones <laughs> kick in at a certain point. I mean, everybody yeah. understands but those relationships, but to develop... This is a, the kind of relationship we're talking but about. But to develop a relationship with a spiritual being who is not actually, actually physically in the chair next mm -hmm. to you or at the dinner table, um, that needs to be defined, uh, mm -hmm. how to do that. It's different well, for everybody. I don't think you can yeah. do that. Oh. Do this and you will have a relationship. Yeah. Better than but nothing. I, what, I can <laughs> say, what I can say is this. If you don't take time, if you don't care about that person, if you never bother to get to know them, you're not going to have a relationship. I can say that absolutely. And the longer you have that relationship, the less foggier the relationship yeah. seems. 
Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a process of time. It's just. Yeah. But some people need to go to a classroom to get to know God. Mm -hmm. For me, my classroom is nature. <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, you know, we're talking about this relationship that grows over time. You just said that, whatever. What if, what if a person just hears about Jesus Christ and decides to go with him, mm -hmm. uh, and one hour later he gets killed? Well, the we're talking the about cross. the thief on the cross, aren't we? And then maybe not one hour later, but basically that was the idea. Mm -hmm. And God can look at that person and say, that was a genuine choice. That person really decided, I'm giving up my old way of life. I, I, I see something new and better. I want to go that way. And God says, that was, that was a real choice. I, I accept that. Okay, you're talking about choice, sir, but as far as relationship goes, nothing really has come across yet. Yeah, um, he didn't have so very much time to re build that relationship, but not, he had enough for, for God. And you said that the relationship was important for the change mm -hmm. that a person has to have. So he didn't really change all that much yet. And not to throw a monkey wrench into things here, but you see, as it was discussed a little earlier, God is able to see, Jesus is able to see right in that instant that there won't be any problems in the future. So. Mm -hmm. He gets to go in. And, and it was heartfelt. For those of us who trust in the writings of Ellen White, she says that this man who was on the cross next to him had earlier been attracted to Jesus, had been to his meetings, had seen some things, had gotten to know him, and then he said to himself, no, this man couldn't possibly rewrite. He's being opposed by all our leaders. You know, there's no way all of these wise men and the Sanhedrin and so forth could be wrong. Jesus must be wrong. There's no, because they're in opposite poles here. There's no way. And so he turned away from Jesus, fell into crime, and now he's being crucified by Jesus. And he looks over there and he says, you know what? I know this guy. And then he says, you know, <coughs> Master, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But he did make fun of him like the other At thief first. did for, for a while. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe that the change happened sometime after that. Well, you know, well, that's exactly what Satan does. You, you're going towards Jesus and you're getting drawn towards him and Satan will put these people in your way. He will put the Pharisees and the scribes to take your focus off God and turn you on sinful man. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the great examples of faith in the Bible is someone called Abram or Abraham. Abraham lived about 2,000 years before Christ. He was the first character in the Bible whose life was spelled out in, in considerable detail. There are many ups and downs, we all know the stories, but over the years, Abraham developed a very close personal relationship with Jesus, who by, I might add, was the God of the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and Luke 24, 44. He's, he's, Jesus himself says so. Finally, in a terrible test, when Abraham was 120 years old, God asked him to take the promised son Isaac three days journey to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there as an offering to God. Why did God ask him to do such a thing? It's pretty clear that the devil has been making fun of God all over the universe because God had claimed Abraham as his friend. Every time Abraham fell, the devil mocked. No doubt he asked, what do you think of this friend of, Ab a friend of God out here? So when he finally reached Mount Moriah and informed his son of God's orders, Isaac, demonstrating his trust in God, agreed to be bound by his aged father and placed on the altar. Abraham raised the knife and prepared to kill his son when God stopped him. There were no other human beings present. That was a demonstration primarily to the universe that Abraham could be trusted. And that trust demonstrated his faith or trust in God. And that story is spelled out in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 154, paragraph 3 to 155, paragraph 2. No wonder Abraham was called a friend of God. So the question now is, how do we become friends of God? Is it because God declares us that way, or do we become friends of God by being transformed by our personal faith relationship with Him? There's a famous verse. It's found in Genesis 15. We're going to talk more about it again and again. 
Look at Genesis 15, verses 5 and 6. God, the Lord, took him outside and said, Look at the sky and try to count the stars. You will have as many descendants as that. Abraham put his trust in the Lord. Because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Now, there are other places. This is referred to in various places. We're saved by faith. Uh, God wants to make us his friends, etc. Abraham demonstrated his trust in God. God says that all who fully trust him, as Abraham did, will receive eternal life. How does that work? Do we somehow magically benefit from what Christ did? Or is it that we benefit because we have come to understand why he died and what that means for our salvation? Does understanding Jesus make us want to love him? Well, circumcision or lack of circumcision, being a Jew or being a Gentile, being a slave or being free, being a male or being a female, are not the issue. These things make no difference. Paul just spells that out in Galatians 3.28. Genuine faith is a response to God. It is not something that we do, a feeling or an attitude, apart from God's reaching out to us. So what does faith actually do for us? And the bottom line here, as we're running out of time, is faith sets us free to have that right relationship with God. It sets us free to do what we want to do if we really understand what is right and we choose to do what is right. It is essential, if you come to think about it carefully, that we come to have as complete and correct a picture of God, His character, and His government as is possible. I mean, if we're beholding and we're being changed, we don't want to be changed into the wrong thing, do we? No wonder Satan has done everything possible down through the generations to distort the picture of God, to misrepresent Him. He wants us to believe that God is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. He calls God a tyrant. We believe, by contrast, that Christ was sinless throughout His entire life. Does that mean He kept the law perfectly? Absolutely. His record is spotless. So is Christ's obedience effective for making for producing or for producing our salvation if we believe that God simply declares us righteous by justifying us and if this process happens over and over and over again with little or no change in us some people would suggest that this is an encouragement for people to sin and we're running out of time but I think you can see the argument this is no heavenly make believe people who have faith are really changed it is a radical change our old sinful ways are gone and we become more like Jesus. See you next time.